Good morning, good morning, everybody. Good to see here, everybody here. Uh, if you're a visitor, please uh, stay a little bit longer, and we'll uh, we want to get to know you. If you have kiddos, they'll be dismissed right before sermon. And they have, we have some wonderful children's programs to uh, they can attend. It is October. Holy cow! I was ready for August to get over with. We're in October. I gotta see a uh, show of hands. Who has started their Christmas shopping? Come on, come on. There we go. All right, all right. All right, very good, very good. I'll give you my list after a bit here. Let's continue singing. God sent his son, they called him Jesus. He came to love, heal and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to my Savior lives, because He lives, I can face tomorrow, because He lives, all fear is gone, because I know He holds a future, and life is worth a living just because He lives. Because he lives, and then one. 
life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know He reigns. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all oh, fear is gone. Because I know He holds the future, and life is worth a living just because He lives. Listen to what is written in God's word as we prepare for communion. Peter is speaking of Christ in one of his letters. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. 
When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you are like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Remember as you eat the bread that because of his broken body you have been healed. He has a place for you in heaven. Let's pray for the bread. Dear God, our Father, help us to remember that, that Jesus' body suffered and was broken for us and that it was broken for our redemption. We send these words through his power. Amen. Again, remember as you drink this grape juice that because of his shed blood, you've been healed. You're forgiven of your sins because of his sacrifice for you. Let's pray for the juice. Father, help us to remember that you suffered when your blood was shed for us. Thank you, Jesus. And that it was shed for our redemption. We send these words through his power. Amen. Let's now focus on offerings and contributions. This time has been set aside to pray for blessings for our contributions and offerings. Many of you have already given in the container in the foyer, and if you haven't already, you can give after the service is over. Let's pray for our offerings. Father, bless our time, our talents, and our monetary gifts. May they be put aside for a use that lifts you up and glorifies you and your Son, our Lord Jesus. We send these words through his power. Amen. In moments like these, I sing out a song. I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like these, I lift up my voice. I lift up my voice to the Lord. Singing I
Well, good morning, church. It's good to see you today. We have some visitors today and people back in from college. So we're excited about seeing them. If you're visiting today, thank you so much for being with us. And uh, I just enjoy this time to spend with you as well in God's Word. And he's been so faithful this week to answer a lot of prayers on behalf of families that are in need and have been in pain and loss. And, and, um, and so our hearts and prayers go out to uh, Linda and Billy Joyce and their family and loss of their, their grandson. And of the tragic accident took place this past week. And um, uh, Robert uh, Smith, uh, one of my students actually, back when I taught out at Lawton Christian Academy, uh, did the service. He did a fine job. He just, he really did. And I'm thankful for that. He gave that reassurance of heaven is real. And it's a place that God has prepared for those that have put their trust in him. And our prayer here, of course, is always the same. It's just that you've put your trust in Jesus Christ. He's the way, the truth, and life. And no one cometh to the Father except through him. And so uh, if I can get an amen on that, I'll get started. If not, I'll just keep on going. All righty. Few of us can say, like uh, Will Rogers said years ago, he said, I never met a man I didn't like. Um, I think Will Rogers never met some people that I've met in my life. I don't know about you. I don't know that he would have said that. But yet what I find out is usually the people that I don't like, they don't like me much either. You ever notice that? Well, if you don't like me, I don't like you either. We kind of go through that. The Bible never assumes that you will get through life without making enemies. It never does. But the Bible only tells us how do we are to deal with our enemies. These are just a few. It says, do not gloat when your enemy falls. That's in Proverbs 24. If your enemy is hungry, feed him in Romans chapter 12. And love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Matthew chapter 5 are just a few of those verses that I sometimes wish they weren't in there, but they're there in plain sight. And they're for me to deal with, not for God to deal with. They're for us. And yet we struggle with them. This message is an old message. It's from way back when. Whatever I, you know, a throwback message, if you will. A good friend of mine, who I were visiting a couple of weeks ago, actually, about different things, and he had brought up this particular story. And he said it was one of his favorites or at the time. And it's, so it's one of my favorite stories this week. And I want to share that with you. And it comes out of the Old Testament. It comes out of the book of 2 Kings. And so we're going to see what God has for us in all of this as we work on our lives and opening in our eyes to what God would have us to see. It is a familiar story. If you are, uh, have been in church anywhere, probably, you've heard this story, perhaps. If you haven't, it's an interesting read. I would encourage you to do so. The story just before it is an interesting read as well because actually this Elisha, this prophet, a prophet back in the day was just selected by God. It was God's way of selecting someone to lead his people or tell his people they were going in the right direction, going in the wrong direction, and what would come of that. And the story just before this is there's, a, there's an interesting one there. And a gentleman loses the axe head. You know, it's steel and it's metal or whatever, and it goes to the, he's lost it, but he's borrowed. He's, it's a borrowed axe, and Elijah says, what's the problem? And he says, uh, it's a borrowed axe, and I, I've lost it. And Elijah prays, and you, you, and you and I both would agree that steel can't float. Wouldn't you? Just shake your head up and down, because you know that, right? But you need to know that it does, if God says float. And so we lead from that story into this story in 2 Kings. And so it is one that we're familiar with, but I'm, I'm going to do a lot of ad-libbing. So Jeff, kind of keep up. Try not to get before me or after me or whatever. Somewhere in between would be great. And I appreciate all your help. And those people in the sound booth do a great job, and we appreciate each of them. Basically, this is what's taking place. Once again, the enemy of God's people want to destroy God's people. <laughs> Nothing new, is it? One of the things you need to remember, please understand that there is an enemy that wants to destroy you. His name is Satan and his warriors. John 10.10, in Scripture, New Testament, John 10.10 tells us that it simply says that Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and yet I have come so that you might have life and have it to its fullest. 
In that one verse, it describes two paths, two roads, two ways. And that's it, because there is only two decisions. You can either choose Jesus in life, or you can choose another road which will lead to death and destruction. It's totally left up to you. That's how much God loves you. You need to know that. God loves you enough to let you make the decision whether you get heaven or not. He's already provided it for all people. Even your enemies, if they choose to follow Jesus in their life. Can I have an amen? amen. All right. So you need to remember that God's people will always have enemies. And we have them as well. So every time the enemy here in 2 King tries to lay an ambush for God's people to destroy them, Elisha the prophet warns the king of Israel, the good king if you will, to not to go there. Don't go over there, that's the enemy. Don't go over there, it's the enemy. And so the king of Aram here, he becomes very angry about it, as you see there on the screen. He becomes very angry about this, and he, he feels as though he's got a traitor within his troops. And so what does he do? He calls his officers in and says, somebody in here is a traitor. Who's telling this guy, who's telling this king of what's going on in the ambushes that we are laying? And they come back and simply say, it's not us. It's Elisha, the prophet of Israel. And he not only tells them where we are, he can even tell them what goes on in your bedroom. And the king is like really upset by now. It's the prophet of Israel. It's Elijah's fault. So the king of Aram says what the bad kings would always do. Well, let's go get him. Let's just surround him, find out where he's at. Let's get him. Let's take care of it. And once we take care of it, we'll be on our way and we will rule the earth, if you will. So he sends out his horses and his chariots and stuff, as you can read there, and a strong force of military to surround the city. And once you're surrounded, you're surrounded. And this was a huge army. Now apparently the next morning, when the servant of Elijah, now Elijah has servants that work for him as well, because that's God's design. People that work underneath you. They do what you can't do. They do seemingly behind-the-scenes stuff. And so the servant gets up in the morning, stretches out, looks outside, and he sees that the city is completely surrounded. And it scares the bejeebers out of him. It would me too. Because his eyes see exactly what's about to happen. They are about to be annihilated. They're about to be wiped out. And so he looks at that, so he asked Elijah, the prophet, he says, what shall we do? Now keep in mind that Elijah... Remember, the act said he could raise that up by just praying to God because of God's hand. And a lot of other things that Elijah does in his ministry, if you will. Keep in mind that Elijah could have called fire from the sky with God's permission and wiped them all out. Poof, they're gone, it's over with. That's exactly what he could have done, but that's not what he did. The first thing that Elijah tells the servant is important for all of us as Christians when we find ourselves surrounded by the enemy and we have them in our lives. The enemy of trouble, the enemy of pain, the enemy of stress, the enemy of worry, the enemy and the enemies just go on and on, don't they, in our lives because we all face with it at some point in our lives. But it's important for us as Christians we find ourselves as we're surrounded. In verse number 16 the word says, don't be afraid. Now that's easier said than done, of course. It's a very difficult thing to stay calm when you know that you are being attacked. Anybody with me besides me? Because when you're under the attack, I mean, you're under the attack. It's you. It's the, you're the one that's suffering. You're the one that's going through this pain. You're the one that's going through this misunderstanding or hurt or whatever it might be in your life. And so it's hard to stay calm when you're surrounded. And there seems to be no way out. When you look at the suicide rate just in the United States of America. It is off the charts. In most cases, many cases, it is because people feel they've been surrounded and there's no way out. You and I have a great deal of work to do, my friend, because we are to tell the world there is a way out and his name is Jesus the Christ. Elijah then gives us the clue of how to calm under pressure the pressure of enemy when it comes, when the attack comes. He tells his servant, your problem is this. You're looking at the enemy and not God. 
Because that's what we do naturally because we're human. Now we've been born again spiritually speaking and we have the power of the Holy Spirit works within us, but I'm still human. I still see with my natural eye and I see the enemy that surrounds me oftentimes, but I understand in this sense that he is saying, you're looking at the enemy and you're not looking at God. I could only think that if there's in this conversation going back and forth, he, his servant might have told him, so, well, what are you talking about? I can see exactly what's going on here. What do you mean, look at God? Perhaps that went on, I don't know. But we fall into that trap as well. As Christians, we look to the trouble, we look at the trouble, we look at the sickness, we look at the disease, we look at the enemy, and we forget God fights for us. God fights for us. Now, is there anything greater than God? The answer is no, so I'm going to say that again. Is there anything greater than God? No. Very good. So then when the enemy comes in with a stronghold, when the enemy comes in and it's attack on you, who do you turn to? Really? See, it's real easy to say because you could write that down on a piece of paper and you were in my class, I would simply say, hey, 100, smiley face, go home and tell mommy. But it's different when you're under the attack. And so sometimes what we have to do is we have to be jolted or we have to be told or we have to be led or we have to be... Oh, I don't know, maybe it's a friend that comes along that somebody says, have you looked to Jesus in this matter at all in your life? Because when we look to the troubles and we look to the sickness and we look to the disease, we're looking at the enemy and we're not looking at a God that can do all things. God fights for us. The battle, we sing, the battle belongs to the Lord. I was going to get Dean to sing that for us. It sounds a lot better, but... Tennessee Ernie Ford out there, but anyway. Um, it, First Samuel teaches that. Teaches the battle belongs to the Lord. And so if the battle is the Lord's, I need to turn to the Lord. Lord, what are we going to do here? That's what the servant actually does. The Lord, I believe, always wants to show his people. Watch this now. I believe that the Lord always wants to show his people, and I are one, Marvin Phillips said. He always wants to show his people in every generation that he will fight for them if they are willing to stand with him. That, that's all. He's just wanting us to stand with him. And the way that he sees that we stand with him is we stand on the truth of God's word. That when the world tells you that a boy can be a boy, a girl and a girl can be a boy, we say the truth of God's word is true. A man is a man and a woman is a woman, period, bottom line. That we stand for the truth. Well, I don't know. You know, he's a little outdated. He's, he did that a long time ago. He may have changed his mind. God has not changed his mind. And I praise God that he hasn't changed his mind. But you see how it can get twisted. And all it is is to get the next generation to believe, well, that's okay too. And that's probably all right. And then acceptance becomes a belief, and the belief becomes an error. And then we have lost. We've lost. But I believe that the Lord, all he calls for us to do is to, is to stand because he will fight for us. It's a big mistake for anyone to attempt to fight battle without God. But you can. And sometimes you win that battle. Sometimes. Sometimes you win the battle on your own. You go, I'm going to push through this baby and I'm just going to pull up my shoestrings or bootstraps or whatever that quote is and, and I'm just going to get through this one because it's all, oh, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, and you do it. Good for you. But in most cases, you won't. And you'll be damaged and you'll be hurt because remember, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So there's a difference there. Elijah's clue for us is don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us, watch this, those who are with us are more than those who are with him. And I think the servant's going, duh, can you not see what I see? And Elijah's saying, can you not see what I see? Hmm. No matter how much you measure, oh, this is good. No matter how much you measure, 
the enemy that's against you, no matter its size, its, its strength, its height, its, its power, no matter how you measure that enemy that's against you, always remember that it always comes in second place compared to God. Always. Always. There's always, they always come in second place. And the, Psalms, uh, the psalmist here writes, Among the gods there is none like you. We sing the song. Jeremiah says the same. There is none like you. My friend, there is none like our God. All other gods are little G gods. Ours is a big G God. And He can do all things. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because now He lives within me. Give me an amen. Now in verse 17, Elijah prayed. Oh, imagine that. He prayed. Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around. The surrounding, or the surrounders were surrounded. It's a good title, I think. It's probably not a word, but I'm going to use it anyway. But nonetheless, here we are. Pray. I pray for the eyes of all of us to be wide open, to be opened, to be open to see what God would have us to see. Because you see, we can watch the news, we can watch the world, we can hear all kinds of things, and when we watch them, we're taking our eyes off the one that says, have you noticed me lately? I'm still here. I'm still God. I haven't moved I still love my people, and I still want to protect my people. And so I pray that our eyes would be opened so that we would see the protection that he has for his children, you and I. But notice, they are not the ones, this army that surrounded God's army, those fiery chariots that could have took them out. But notice, they aren't the ones that took them out. They aren't the ones that defeated the enemy. I find that interesting. They are the ones, however, gave the confidence to the one that needed his faith lifted in a moment of great doubt. Did you catch that? When he could see, when his eyes were opened, he could see. And now he has confidence because what he sees is not natural. He sees what is spiritual and his spiritual eyes have been opened and they're greater than his physical eyes because now his focus is not the army of the world. His focus is the army of God and there is more with them than there is with those guys. Do you see why I love this story so much? Does it look like I enjoy this story? I just love to tell this story. Have me over to school, I'll tell you a story. But i got to somehow get it down to like eight minutes, right? That ain't going to work, Lori. I'm sorry, I'm going to tell her story. She does a great job at school, appreciate her much. Oh, where am I at in this? I get lost in my own excitement, I guess. Here we go. I believe that if we would allow and ask God to open our eyes, I believe that just a little bit, we too then can see that God fights for us. He's still fighting for us. And our confidence, if we will just look and see what God is doing. Did, did, you, did you notice this morning the beauty of his just awakening of his earth? God still moves among us. And if you would just take time, I think, and just open our eyes a little bit and get it off of the, oh, we got to get this, got to get that. Would you just look outside and just a beautiful fall morning and just see that God is still in control. It would give us confidence. It would give us confidence to have the strength to take a stand in a world that says we're going to defeat you one at a time, if that's what it takes. That we could be strong enough that we could stand with God and say, how dare you come against me? How dare you come against my God? How dare you talk about my God that way? Remember David? And he looked at David. He looked at, uh, he looked at the giant, remember? Hey, how dare you talk about... Today, today, 
today. I don't care how many servants you have. I don't care that you have an armor bearer. I don't care you're, because you're 10 feet tall. My God is going to take you down and I'm going to have your head. And it happened. It happened because David took a stand. Once again, I say this a lot because I miss my big brother. You know, he's gone to be the Lord many years and when my brother was present, I had a lot more confidence because he was my big brother. He was the one I knew that had my back. He was the older Davidson. He was the bigger Davidson. He was the lineman. He was going to protect the running back. And he did. And I miss him sorely. The army of the Lord did not win the victory that day in, in and of itself. They could have if that's what God chose to, but he didn't. Notice Elijah does... What he does, he prays in verse number 18 as well. He prays for his eyes to be opened, and then he prays another prayer. Notice what he says. As the enemy came down toward him, now the enemy's closing in. The servant's got to be thinking, what's going on here? I can see that, but I can see them because it's closing in. And as they come down, notice what he does. Elijah prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. The whole army was blinded. The whole army was just blinded in an instant. Oh, I find that very interesting. As we pray for our eyes to be open, may we pray for the enemy's eyes to be closed. That we can pray that prayer. I, my wife prays that prayer often. She says, Father, just let them stumble over themselves. Just let them mumble on and do just this, that they don't even make any sense in any form, any fashion, so that no one will misunderstand what truth really is. Amen. It's that they would stand. And so he says, just blind them, Lord. Just go ahead and do that. And he prayed to God, and the enemy was blinded. I'm not sure about his servant at this point, but I think his servant at this point's got to be going, oh, how about you? That's me. Oh, I couldn't, hey, could you imagine the old army is blinded? I can't see, Joe, where you at? Hey, Sam, hey, where you at? I can't see nothing. Where you at? Hey, come on, we am walking in circles. It's got to be hilarious, if nothing else. Kind of, when you read it the way I do anyway. But anyway, see what's taking place. I'm standing there. And I just got to believe this guy's just going, what's going on? But watch. This is what takes place in verse number 19 and following. I love this part of the story as well. So Elisha walks up to him. They can't see him. Hello, gentlemen. Where are you headed? Oh, we're after this guy called Elisha. Oh, really? Yeah, he's around here somewhere. Oh, you guys are on the wrong road. Just follow me and I'll show you where he is. I'll just gladly take you in. You see God? Tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. So here's all these blind guys following this guy, and they're saying, hey, we can't see anything, but this guy's a really good guy. He's going to take us to him, and maybe we can see later on, and we'll wipe him out. And I just believe that Elijah has to be smiling, at least smiling with what's going on. I would be cracking up. Maybe not so much of being this happening, but just to see these guys that are there. So I'm trying to produce something here I want to tell you today that when you see the power of God defeating your enemy I believe it will bring you great joy in your life some of you have seen God move in your life in powerful ways and it has brought you joy but for some reason along the line you forgot about that joy somewhere along the line you forgot about that day when you were really full of the joy of the Lord I want to remind you that God is the same yesterday today and forevermore give me an amen Alrighty. If you're already ready for some more, give me an amen. amen. All right. Three of you are. Let's go. As they march in, now this is what's happening. So they march into the city of Samaria. That's, that's the, the God's people. And they march right into the city courts, if you will. And here they come. And I've got to be thinking that all these people that are God's people, they've got to be a little bit afraid, of course, I would think. They don't really realize they're blind, but eventually I'm sure they do. And they bring, he brings them in to the middle of the court, if you will. And Elijah brings them in, in the middle of the city, and then he prays another prayer. What does that tell you about Elisha? He is a man of prayer. Prayer connects us with God. 
It is actually our umbilical cord to God. We need what God provides. And when we pray, He nourishes us like the mother does. The mother does to the child that she's about to bear. Now, so he says, he prays and he says, open their eyes. And all the king of Israel, this is the good king now, all the king of Israel can say basically is, Elijah, do you want us to kill them now? And here is a statement that is actually, you would definitely not get into military higher level of making decisions if you made this decision. No, no, no Brad, no, no general is going to give this order, so watch what he does. He comes into the picture here and he says, no. He said, I tell you what I want you to do. I think what we should do is we should pair, prepare a great meal for them. Not a last supper, but a great meal for them. And then I think we need to send them home. Who, who verse 22 and following, but who does that? Nobody that I know of. Nobody, but he does. I'm going to be honest with you. If I'm that guy right there, I'm just saying, sick them. They want to defeat us. We'll defeat them, and we'll have no more problem out there. Let's just get it over here once and for all. God's with us. It's got to be. He's brought them here. Let's just take them out. That's what I think. But I know what Scripture says. Remember what I gave you earlier on. Let me give you a few more. Or, yeah, a segment here. Jesus, mind you, is the one that's saying this. So it's red letter edition if you look at it. And it says this, But you who are listening, I say, are you listening today? So when God speaks, you, you have a choice. When you read God's word, you have a choice to listen or not listen. And, and many times I'm not listening, I'm just reading. He says, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn your other cheek and get that one smacked as well. And if he asks you for your coat, give him your shirt as well. And in Matthew 5, he says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And I'm like, what? what, what wait, hold, time out. Does anybody in this room struggle with that besides me? Man, we got a lot of saints in this room, and I am so thankful for you. <laughs> I'm just bearing it all. Might as well take this vest off. There's no S on my chest. Here we go. I struggle with that. Now, don't get me wrong. The Bible teaches that there is a time to kill. There's a time to take the sword up. I believe that with all my heart. There is a time to kill. And there's a time to heal. So when I read over that, and I look at that scripture, scripture again, and I, I find it a little, I find myself a little confused. Not that Jesus said it, because I can read that Jesus said it. So I'm not confused that Jesus said these words. Where I get confused is how I accept it. Because sometimes I accept it. And when, I do, when I'm on the good side, I go, oh boy, that's really good. I did really good. That guy treated me bad and I treated him good and I did it in the name of Jesus. And I wish that was every day, but it's not every day. Is anybody with me here? I wish it was, but he's still working on me. And I believe he's still working on you as well, and I pray the case is. But I did notice something in these scriptures here. Is, I noticed this one thing. It did not say... It did not say that we are to become like them. Do you see it? This is really important in your life. It's telling us we're not to become like them. They're our enemy. They hate us. They despise us. They tell us lies. They cheat. They steal. They do all the things that we don't like. But God tells us, He's telling us, don't become like them. Don't become like them. Why does he say that? Because if we become like them, we are them. You see how it works? It's real easy for us to look with that hatred 
and gets so mad that hatred comes through. But then actually, if you stop and pause a minute, wait a minute, I'm doing the reverse. I'm becoming the enemy of the enemy, and God is saying, I need to pray for, and who's going to be praying for me then? The enemy? No. I'm the one to be praying for them. I'm the one to be praying for myself, not to fall into Satan's trap, because Satan loves for God's people to hate what God gave his son for. Did you catch that? It's important that we get that. That we have to be careful in our zeal, in our drive and wrongdoings that we don't become the opposite of and we become exactly like what we say we hate. Maybe I spent too much time there, but it means for me. May God give us the strength to do what is called, he has called us to do. And to have the knowledge, his knowledge and his wisdom to know when, and listen, this is important, and to know when to extend the hand or the sword because there is a time for both. But it must be in the wisdom and the knowledge of God's doing, God's timing in our lives. And you can tell how long ago I wrote this message. And as Forrest Gump would say, that's all I got to say about that. But I'm not finished, but almost. Here was one I found it's interesting years ago. It's in my good stuff file. When Leonardo da Vinci was painting The Last Supper that you see here on the screen, he was in, in this intense, bitter battle argument with a fellow painter. They would often paint together, many of them. Stories told. Leonardo was so angry with this gentleman that he decided to actually paint the face of his enemy, this man that he despised and hated. He decided that he was going to paint his face into the image of Judas, which was the betrayer of Christ. And he did. And it looked just like the man he hated. All the other painters around knew exactly what he had done because it was an exact portrait of the one he hated when he finished Judas there he continued his work on the painting but as much as he tried he could not paint the face of Christ over and over and over and over again he painted the face of Christ but something was holding him back from finishing and Leonardo the story goes on to say that Leonardo uh, decided that his hatred toward his fellow man his painter friend, was the problem. And so he worked through his hatred by repainting Judas's face with just a no-name person and just painted it. Only then was he able to paint Jesus' face and complete the masterpiece. Maybe God is trying to teach me to not hate because when I hate, it actually destroys me. In Romans chapter 12, do your best to live at peace with everyone. It's to do our best. My friend, do not try to punish others. This translation says others when, you are, when they are wrong. But wait for God to punish them with his anger. It is written, I will punish those who do wrong. I will repay them, says the Lord. Back to our story there in 2 Kings as we close. After, they are, after they're fed and they're sent back home, it's an amazing story they have to tell. Can you imagine their journey home? Two, three days, however long it took to get back to their homeland. Of what their journey was. Man, I couldn't see nothing, could you? Nope, man, that, that lamb was good. They couldn't see. Their story that they had to tell on their way home in verse 23 and it goes on to say that so he prepared this great feast for them and he sent them on their way so the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory that's all they wanted anyway now I would love to tell you that the story ends there but it actually doesn't and I would love to tell you that the enemy never returned against Israel 
because it hadn't and it still won't today. Here's what basically took place. Aaron selects a new king. After their king dies out, they select a new king. There's no trouble with Israel. But the new king comes along and he thinks once again that he can outmaneuver God. Imagine that. Listen closely. There are people in our world today, always, always have been and always will be, that will be put in particular leadership positions that think that they can do what they want to when they want to. The king here may have been able to control and manipulate his people, but he would never be able to control our God, ever. But he was about to find out that God can never be defeated. If you read the rest of the story, or the, the story as it unfolds there. But keep in mind as Christians, and this is huge in our lives, because I don't know where this lies, because I can't see into the future. I am not a prophet. But keep in mind as Christians, there may be a great suffering before there is the deliverance of God in our lives. I just can't tell you what that will be. But I know that God stands on his promise. I know that God will not be defeated. And if I am in Christ Jesus, even if the world takes me out of the world, nothing can separate me from my God. The enemy will return as long as you live. Just in Second Chronicles, if you look at that last part of the verse, go out and face them tomorrow, tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow. There will be enemies around us. However, as Christians, the more we study God's word, the more we know of his great plan, and we grow in the likeness, his likeness, the easier it should be for us to have eyes wide open so that we would see that God fights for us, that God defends us, that God will come through for us, that God will rescue us. Have your eyes been opened today? Do you see Jesus wanting to come to your rescue? Aren't you tired of seeing the enemy? Aren't you tired of looking at the enemy? And look to what God would have you see with your eyes open. Open your eyes and look to the hills. Those who are with us are more than those that are with them. God's love is a faithful love for all generations. And if we will ask him to open our eyes to see, to see him, we will always see the victory and our enemy should fade in his likeness about us. Let's pray. Father, my prayer today is for, starting with me, Father, just continue to open my eyes so that I might see you more. Open our eyes and our hearts and our minds to receive from you, Father. The world is pouring so much false Things, the false teachings into our lives. Help us to be able to resist it by counting on and filtering it through the spirit that lives within us. Because, Father, you've given us the truth. The world doesn't have the truth unless they look to your word. For it is the truth. It is what sets people free. It is what gives us freedom. It is what gives us eternal life. It is what gives us hope in a lost and dying world. But help us, Father, not to hate. And forgive me when I do or even use that word because it is a heavy one. Father, please help us not to turn and become like what we know is evil, what we know is wrong. Help us to reflect Jesus in more of what we do in a world that is lost so that others might come to salvation through your son Jesus the Christ is my prayer in his name amen and amen God bless you thank you for, you, for again for your patience this morning if you need to respond in any way we have cards that you can fill out just let one of us know we'll be glad to take care of that come together as we stand and sing faithful love flowing down from the thorn-covered crown
makes me whole, saves my soul, washes whiter than snow. Faithful love calms each fear, reaches down, dries each tear, holds my hand when I can't stand on my own. Faithful love, faithful love from Show the Father's love And I'll never, and I'll never be, the be the same For I've seen faithful love face to face And Jesus is His name Faithful love is a friend just when hope seems to end, welcome face, sweet embrace, tender touch filled with grace, faithful love, endless power, living flame, spirit's fire, burning bright in the night, guiding my way, faithful love. Show the Father's love And I'll never, I'll never be, the be the same For I've seen faithful love face to face And Jesus is His name For I've seen faithful love Jesus is His name. Got several announcements for you today, and um, a thank you that I'd like to read. <clears throat> we'll start with that as soon as I get it opened. Dear Western Hills family, thank you so much for the gorgeous fall arrangement uh, that you sent after my recent surgery. Your visits, phone calls, cards, texts, and food have all been so appreciated. You are some of the most kind and loving congregation that we have ever been around, and we are so grateful. May the Lord bless you for the way you have, the way you bring uh, uh, so much joy to so many people. And that's from Randy and Brenda Curry. So, I love to read these, and we get to read them frequently because you're a special congregation, and you love each other so much, and it reflects itself daily and weekly as we all deal with the trials of life. Uh, let's see. You all have the order of worship, and it's got several announcements on the back that are important. Please take a look at these. There's three I will bring to your attention today because this is the last day to sign up for three of these things or to get involved in three of these things. This is the last day to sign up for the Youth Fall Retreat at uh, Oak Ridge Christian Camp in Anadarko. So youth, if you're planning on doing that, you need to see Zach today and get that taken care of. Uh, this is the last day to participate in diaper donations for the Junior League of Lawton's Diaper Drive. See Paige McLaughlin. If you need any information on that, wave your hand, Paige. Zach, where are you? Well, there's Zach. Okay, I was looking in the wrong place. That hand over there. And then the last one is, this is the last day to sign up for feeding the staff at Edison Elementary on October 4th. And if you would like to help participate, if you'd like to participate in that, please see Janice Croft. Now Janice is probably not in here. I bet she's back with uh, Sunshine. But see Janice if you want to sign up and participate in, in that effort. And then the uh, last thing is, I'd like for you to put the scripture up for today. 
And I'd just add that Harley and I did not talk to each other at all this week, and I had no idea what he would be preaching about. So uh, would you please stand and we'll do this, say this scripture together, and then we'll, we'll be, I'll have a prayer and we'll be done. Deal bountifully with your servant, that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes, that I may behold wonderful things from your law. God, as we move into this week, we pray that you would fill us with your spirit, and God, that we might see the world with your eyes. Open our eyes to see life and all its decisions, and give us the wisdom to walk with you in all we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed week.